Hi everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me for this virtual session. Um, today we're gonna walk you through the OWASP local no code top 10, tell you all about the project and the main goal behind this session is to get you involved. We also have a couple of, uh, of our top contributors in the crowd so I'm gonna let them do the Q&A and you can also reach out to them afterwards uh, because I have no way to, uh, to hear to see a response so you might uh, like even if you're bored and uh, five minutes later you, you won't be in the in the room I won't know so uh, no hard feelings all right um, OWASP top 10 has been like that the, the idea of OWASP top 10 has been something that has been helping developers uh, uh, since uh, like for, for a long time now um, and there has been a, and in recent year we've seen uh, multiple projects that have started to create top 10 that, that are dedicated to specific things, to, to specific uh, kinds of risks or areas of risks which are not uh, illustrated by the, by the main project. And so before I take you through like understanding the top 10 for low code, no code, I think it's important for us to cover why do we, why do we actually have to, like why, why is local no-code different? Why do we have to create a different list or a different security project that's dedicated to local no-code? I think a different way to ask the same question is what is different? What is different about, about low-code, no-code development from professional development? And so I think this, uh, like what you're seeing right now on screen is, uh, is a demo from the Microsoft low-code, no-code platform. You can see that uh, by talking to chat, you can automatically generate applications on the fly. These applications, uh, this, applica this is an application that would uh, actually behind the scenes generated a table, a SQL table for you in, a, in a, a table in a managed SQL server behind the scenes. You can later share that application with other users which can use their own identities or your identity in order to access data. So this is a pretty significant piece of software that is right now being, being built just with this chat interface. So the development experience here is <laughs> quite different than uh, what we are actually, what we're used to. Um, this is actually the latest improvement in low-code, no-code, but this idea of empowering everybody to be a developer, like lowering the bar to building applications, is, is at the core at, uh, of what low-code, no-code actually is. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that this is not, this is used for uh, business critical applications that are driving large organizations today. Let me give you one example. This is a, so, so a couple of years back when you went to Microsoft campuses physically, you had to uh, provide your proof of uh, vaccination for COVID-19. And in order to do that, you use the low-code app to upload your proof. Of course, uh, this is pretty important, pretty uh, important information, right? Uh, so healthcare information that uh, about specific uh, specific individuals. So it's uh, pretty important that we keep it safe. So this is just one scenario. There's actually a plenty of more scenarios that people have created around COVID-19. But really, low code, no code is is in, because it's enabling m more people to be part of the kind of development ecosystem, then you'll see a whole bunch of use cases get solved that typically would just not get addressed. And w once we cover the, like, what people are building with low code or the type or, or one application that I've just shared with you, I think it's important for us to, like this is a, like OWASP, OWASP is, a, is an application security uh, organization and this is an application security conference. And so when we are thinking about application security, it's important to know that we've been focusing on professional developers, right? So we've been focusing on what these, uh, on what developers have been building uh, with code. Uh, so, for example, uh, you can see on screen the number five million. This, this is the number according to Microsoft of .NET developers that are currently active today. So, five million professional developers building applications with .NET uh, across the entire globe. Compare that to the number of citizen developers or the number of users that are building with low-code, no-code that was produced by that was introduced by Microsoft a few years back. Right now, according to Microsoft, there are about eight million of those. And so, everything we know as AppSec has been focused on the things that professional developers are building, but low-code, no-code expands the definition of what a developer is. 
And so we are leaving most of these developers really uh, alone to, 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 take, to take their decisions. And, and of course, uh, we know that where that would lead us. The last thing I would say on that note is AI. One of the things that you're seeing, of course, right now, every large organization is trying to get as much as they can out of AI, gener generating business applications, uh, transforming their business to just work faster to leverage this technology. And what you're seeing on screen as a release is, a, is an announcement by EY, which uh, they announced uh, a partnership with Microsoft where they're going to use uh, uh, OpenAI uh, and, and, uh, and, Azure to, and uh, Azure AI to basically uh, rethink all of their processes. But the interesting thing about this announcement is that they, would, they, they say that w when you see this announcement, you're thinking, oh, all right, they, they're going to use AI, but something is going to have to build to like hold those applications together, right? You would need to write those applications with .NET, for example, um, and, then, and, and then use AI within those applications. But no, the, this announcement states that they're going to use no, Microsoft's no-code platform rather than Azure to build those applications. And it actually makes sense because who's better to know how to drive the business forward than, than business users that can use uh, low-code and no-code platforms. So uh, essentially, uh, AI makes no code even more important because it aim is it's the applications that it, that it is able to produce that no code is able to produce are more complex, but it also means that it's easier to create those applications. And so this is really important for us to get right quickly. The next thing I want to cover is how these applications get how do these applications get built because one other thing that we are assuming when we're talking about AppSec is the existing the existence uh, of the SDLC, and this is a, like a caricature of the of the SDLC. Uh, of course, every organization would see this somewhat differently, but we have we have been very focused in recent years in AppSec on leveraging this SDLC as a point to plug in a bunch of controls, security controls. So like. Most of the con security controls you can think of, they rely on the fact that the SDLC exists. So threat mod modeling needs to happen some uh, sometime along this process of so security review. Shift left relies on having those CI/CD pipelines, cons code scanning, runtime protections. All of these controls and mechanisms rely on the consistent process that developers would use to build their applications on the existence of DevOps. Uh, now, let's try to think about how this translates to the world of uh, low-code or no-code. And, 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 and I'm using these terms interchangeably. If you'd like kind of a drill down on that and the differences or whether there are differences, uh, let's use the Q&A for that. And so if we're thinking about no-code and how, uh, and how uh, the STLC works there, then essentially the there's nothing really forcing you to have any sort of SDLC. So the business user is the only person who, uh, who, who goes through the entire circle. There is no exchange of hands. There's no product manager involved or, or, or a security or an engineering team involved. There's just a business user. They're, they're seeing a problem. They're thinking about the solution. They just do it. And when I mean they just do it, I mean they drag and drop boxes. They talk to, to a chat. And that's it, the application gets deployed to production. There's no review, there's no monitoring, nothing at all. Now, I know that uh, with some platforms, and particularly, uh, particularly on the low-code side, there are developers that are using low-code, no-code in a way that's uh, kind of like professional developers. They have CICD, they have, they have mechanisms behind it, but they really need to like fight their way to, to get this to work, and nothing is really uh, there's no really f real forcing factor to get to make sure that this is actually happening. So we are reliant on the fact that um, like developers would uh, would do it, uh, would would create those processes. There are no controls that are built in, which puts us in a very bad situation. So because when we are thinking about the security controls that we're used to, so here's a mapping of all of the security controls you just saw in the previous slide. Um, these are really n not relevant in the world of low-code, no-code, exactly because there's no SDLC. So 
security training is is very different when you think if if we had uh if we, if you think it's difficult to talk to a developer about security imagine having that conversation from, from somebody from the finance team uh or, or the for or the fraud team or the sales team i mean that's a very difficult conversation to have um in terms of threat modeling because the number of applications that we're seeing with low code no code is is, is enormous you can't really do anything manual so security reviews and threat modeling are really out the window unless you can automate them uh, code scanning well it's kind of problematic because there's no code to scan right so the, your existing tools just would not work um, most platforms do not even produce artifacts for you to scan so some platforms would give you the binaries so you can scan the binaries others won't and even if you can scan the binaries it would be very difficult to kind of Uh, carve out what what's really uh, what's really uh, about the business logic rather than the code generation part uh, in terms of kind of security gates <laughs> well you need CICD for that right so in order to, to put those gates somewhere uh, vulnerability scanning is is, is uh, difficult because it's difficult to understand again what is the part of your business logic from the outside looking in you'll end up finding most of the most of the uh, assumed issues on the platform itself um, logs sometimes they are lacking uh, and and you and you can't really do anything about it because it's running on somebody else's cloud and instrumentation is, is not really possible so this is just background to understand why we need to focus on low code no code as a kind of a, as a separate thing as a as a new discipline within application security and with that let me share a bit about the always uh, low code no code top 10 um, This project, has, uh, we started this project uh, more than two years ago. Uh, there are now more than 200 people across our uh, multiple communication channels uh, that, are, that are part of this group. Uh, we have many contributors. Some of them uh, are, in the, are in the audience today. Uh, Don, John, uh, raise your hand so uh, people will know that you're there. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to send people your way uh, later, uh, later on. Let me... Um, try to um, let, let's so let me share a bit about like what's special about this project so here is our focus uh, and, and we're focused on, on on the things that are unique for low code no code uh, the developers that we are like the, the developers we're thinking about when we're writing this top 10 uh, can be any anyone from a professional developer that is using low code no code to accelerate their work And a citizen developer, which means anybody, anybody on the enterprise. We cannot assume any SDLC. I mean, we can, we can suggest it. We can, uh, we can uh, uh, showcase why it's important, but we cannot assume that it's there. We cannot assume existing security controls. We need to assume a much bigger scale of applications. Uh, so you're seeing here between a 10x and a 100x more applications. Think about the, how... AppSec processes need to change to accommodate those numbers. Um, code is generated, so we so everything that's a vulnerability that's about like a, a compilation or every, or anything about uh, like use after free. These kind of things are uh, are kind of on the platform side of the shared responsibility model. So we don't focus there. We are focused on the logical vulnerabilities. So so the application that you've built does it make sense? Right? Does it, the, the, is it doing what it's supposed to do, or does it, does it have any side effects that would allow someone to steal somebody else's identity, exfiltrate data outside of the organization? The risks are very much like the same risks that you used to with application security. They just manifest in a different way through the application logic. And so here's the list, and you can find it online and, and go through kind of each one of the, uh, of the different uh, uh, categories that we have here. Um, The important part to note is that these are all things that uh, that are looking at what have what people have built on top of low code no code they are not focused on like whether the uh, the generated code has some sort of a weird quirk they are uh, that that would allow you to to to, uh, to to get in through a vulnerability they are focused on really kind of the logical the the business logic that was uh, that is embedded within that application and does it make sense and This, so, like, looking at business logic has been something that we've, we've been trying to do at AppSec for, uh, like, for, since forever. Um, 
With low code, no code, it's finally something that we that we can do because the environment is pretty is is more defined, uh, is less like a, a fully open, and so you can actually you can actually get kind of meaningful insights out of uh, exploring business logic. And so let me show you uh, let me show you how this looks like uh, for for one specific category. So here's the account personalizing category. The the uh, this is a, this is a this is a risk that's focused on um, like when one user is able to impersonate another through a low code no code app. The first section that we have is a very short description. Uh, you can see a short description that is targeting uh, professional secu security professionals. The gist. You can also see a user business user description. This is a, a contribution by uh, John and, and Yana, and John is, is right now uh, 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 here in the room. Um, this is pretty new for OWASP, right? This is giving, this is trying to uh, to talk to business language on their uh, in in plain language uh, to business users in plain language, uh, so they can understand the risks for themselves. This is trying to uh, democratize access to to security knowledge for everyone, not just developers. On top of that, we have uh, attack scenarios and misuse scenarios. These are clear scenarios for what could go wrong. So how exactly could this risk manifest and how could either a, an attacker, how could an attacker take advantage of, of such a risk? Or how could, um, uh, how could, how could a, mis, a misuse or a misconfiguration result uh, in this problem? And so, and again, you're, you're seeing this both from the security professional side uh, perspective and the business user perspective. And of course, we also have this section that's uh, aimed on, on, on prevention. So what could, you do, uh, what could you do better to prevent this kind of risk? Now, we have this for every, every one of the, uh, each one of the top 10. And this is currently where we're at. We're also, we're also uh, we're working on adding uh, many different, kind of different uh, aspects to, this, to, to each one of the categories, but I'll get uh, get uh, go more in, into this the, into details on, on that on that front uh, later on. Uh, in terms of how we operate, uh, so we mostly operate out of a Slack and an email uh, a Slack uh, group and an email uh, group. Uh, so, sorry, a Slack channel and an email group. You'll you'll see the uh, links in a moment, and you can also uh, just check us out on on Twitter, and the links are there. Um, the Idea behind the so the idea behind the methodology loop is just to provide uh, everyone the ability to participate. So we'll uh, use either contributions from the community or statistics that come from the community, and you can see some numbers there about the number of uh, applications and automations that we has as a project have as, have had access to 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 actually review or to view statistics on. Um, this produces a draft, which later everybody can comment on and provide feedback uh, and review. And once uh, uh, all, all, all comments have been satisfied, this is uh, published as, a, as, as like a, a, the official version. Um, so uh, and this is just the, the initial kind of uh, take uh, on, on the process, but we're working on, on, on ways to uh, expand that even, even further. Um, one thing I'd like to so I've, up until now I've kind of I've covered m many topics, but I haven't given you an example of uh, what kind of risk we're seeing, and I think it's important for you to see at least one of them. So let me show you a concrete, uh, real-world uh, example of a specific application that uh, that's, uh, that was built in a large uh, U.S. Uh, enterprise, and this is going to be kind of a kind of a live exercise, right? So I'm going to describe uh, this application. How do I, how, how can I, uh, I'm going to show you how I build this application. And while I do that, please put on your security reviewer hat and think about the logical vulnerabilities that can occur, uh, that, are, that do occur when I, when I build this application. So what could go wrong? And uh, let, me still, let me start by describing the application. Of course, the, when, when an employee onboards a new organi a, 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 an organization, there are many kind of uh, 
different processes that needs to ha need to happen. In this particular case, the HR team wanted to create basically an intake form. Just grab a just get a bunch of information from the user uh, to store on, on, on their on their internal uh, uh, on their in, uh, internal systems. And so, uh, let me show you how I build this with uh, Power Platform, Microsoft's uh, local local platform. And so I log into the Power Apps uh, environment. Uh, I'm going to the default environment. This is basically uh, the, uh, the, co the this is the environment where everybody can can collaborate and every everybody can work. I'm going to create an application, and you can see that the application again is just a simple imp intake form. It has it collects a bunch of information about the new employee, like the full name, the address, uh, so social security number, phone phone number, so everything that the HR team needs. This data would need to to be um, uh, stored somewhere, so I'm going to use. Uh, you can see that under data, I'm going to use something called Microsoft Dataverse. So. Microsoft Dataverse is actually a pretty cool concept. This is a managed SQL server that Microsoft handles for you. Um, that you can, that every developer can just create uh, a table in without realizing that there's even a, a database there. And this is actually what's happening here. So I'm just I'm storing the data in a specific table that I've created. Uh, in, in Microsoft Dataverse, and I'm not. I don't need to handle the the data the database at all. Now, this is not a concept that's um, that's uh, that exists only in Microsoft. This is a very common concept in in, in low code applications. And so, this is where I'm going to store uh, store the data. Um, what I'm also going to do is create an automation where every time there's a new record inserted into that table, I'm going to send uh, a, an email together with some of the information to the entire HR team so they know that a, a, an employee has been on onboarded. And so um, now that you've seen the application, what could go wrong? So again, just kind of take a moment and think for yourself what could go wrong in this application? What if you would if you would be the one uh, getting, doing a security review for that application? What would you uh, what would you uh, uh, ilu illustrate or illuminate? All right. So putting on the attacker's uh, hat, if I log into the to the application, you can see that uh, well, uh, like this is this is what happens when you log into the application. You see there's a bunch of information there. You saw that the uh, application was created uh, in the default environment. So this, the, the, the default environment is great because everybody can build applications there. But the problem is that when everybody can build applications there, uh, some of the permissions are uh, by default kind of uh, pretty wide. And so every user that has access to this environment, which is everybody, can just find the table that sits behind that application and just review the data. So just find that application sensitive is the table sensitive input go to go to the table and just review all of the data for for all of the submissions and now even though uh not it's not like all of the users in that environment had access to uh were, were granted edit access to the application but just like inadvertently i have used here a database that is accessible to the entire organization so there are a couple of problems here. So right, the first thing is that, uh, well, you are just seeing on screen social security numbers. Of course, uh, these are not real. Don't worry. Um, but that's like that's kind of uh, one problem, right? So um, you're seeing that a this is a this is a this is a, an application that stores data in a database that's available to everyone. That's one problem. And the other problem is that the data that it stores is actually in plain text and it needs to be sensitive. Uh, and it's sensitive data. It needs to be treated in a different way. Now, of course, most of the platforms would have a way for you to use uh, like a sensitive input step or something that would make sure that data doesn't just get stored there. But you need to remember to use it. And and as the HR per, uh, the uh, HR professional that has built this application, well, you probably don't know how to store social social security numbers. Um, and uh, while these these are two very concerning issues, there's another one because. Think about, remember that um, when 
when we save the when uh, what another thing that we've created wh is that when somebody submits uh, this form then an automation will run behind the scenes uh, notifying the the uh, the entire HR team well one of the things that happens with low code and no code platform is that many times the automation features they log all of the data that goes through the automation not the fact that there was a, like a um, not not just a log for the fact that they uh, that, that, that they automation executed. I'm talking about the actual data. So you're seeing here on screen the, the social security number, the, like everything that was uh, used in the intake form. And now this data is, is has leaked to the logs of the specific uh, automation, and the automation was shared with the entire HR team. So now the entire HR team has uh, uh, has access to the sensitive data that was written into logs. So this was a pretty like uh, simple application, but we've and, and and we've seen three different findings on that specific application, and you can see kind of uh, under quotes the the categories where where these fall. So this was just one example, but there are but this is uh, this is the way we're seeing organization use the OWASP uh, uh, low code no code top ten as a way to. Uh, as a framework on how to think about the types of applications that are built with low-code, no-code, and how to uh, and where where do you need to focus when you examine those applications? And so, with that, I'm gonna move to the to the last section, which is what have we done uh, in 2020, 2023, which is mainly just sharing our progress and also how can you be part of the project moving forward. So in 2023, we have uh, done a, a, a few things. Uh, first thing is that the project has become uh, a lab project, so we've kind of uh, um, grown up as a, as a NOAS project, which is which is great. Um, the the second thing is that, and and thank you very much for everybody at OWASP that helped uh, us mature as a as a project and, and still are helping. Uh, we've released a stable version of the top ten, which is now kind of uh, we are not going to change it other other than kind of specific uh, other than the fixes, um, because we we are right now trying to work on the 2024 version. I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, we've added more examples to the top 10, more clarity to, to, to the phrasing, to the wording. Um, we've also had a couple of uh, virtual meetups, and they are actually up on YouTube, so uh, you can use the link up on screen to, to, uh, to check them out. And one of the things that we're really proud of this year is, is, the, uh, is the plain language um, uh, uh, translation for business users. And uh, if you're looking to learn anything, uh, to learn more about that, uh, John, who's one of the contributors for that, is actually in the audience. So please reach out to him uh, after the talk. All right, in terms of uh, 2024 plans, so here's what we, here's where we're aiming. The first thing is that we're aiming to kind of do a revamp of the top 10. Um, since we've matured as a project, it's time. Since we have like more people involved as a project, it's time to mature. We're we're trying to uh, to have a like a transparent a transparent process where people can contribute their knowledge and their and their questions and reviews. Uh, so we're going to start by looking a looking at other categories and trying to make sure that the categories uh, are well def are better defined and, and well defined because in some cases I think we, we we know we have room for improvement. We are looking to uh, treat some different forms of low-code, no-code differently uh, because uh, like providing examples for low-code for low code or for RPA or for, uh, or for business process automation could really help uh, uh, people that are like focused on on what they need to solve right now um, to to just understand uh, to understand the risk. We are right now starting a call for data. This actually means that we are hoping that you would reach out to us and share stories, share statistics, anything you can share with us to uh, to make sure that the that the top ten is based on as much data and as diverse data as possible. If you can share statistics, that would be uh, amazing. If you could just share stories, like what have you seen, what part, uh, types of problems have you experienced, uh, or security issues have you have you seen, that would be uh, invaluable for us. Um, 
We're going to look into translation uh, to different languages to get this uh, in, in front of uh, as much people as possible, uh, producing some collaterals to help all of us uh, uh, use this onwards in our organization. And of course, we're going to have more virtual meetups. If you're interested in any of that, in, uh, in joining the community, in just finding out other people that are trying to address application security for local code, no code, Please do get involved. There are plenty of ways to be part of this project, and we're really looking for, uh, uh, for your take on things. So with that, I'll say uh, thank you very much for, uh, for, for being here and, and, and for uh, taking part in this talk. Uh, and I'm going to pass it on to uh, Don and John for Q&A. Any questions? Do you see this slowing down any, or is this going to keep going, this no-code no code adoption? So, so the question is, do we see things slowing down any? No, I think it's just going to keep going up, up, and up. Within, our, within, within Microsoft, our own internal tenant is doubling it in size every two years, and compared to the graphs that were up here yesterday, that's slow uh, compared to other companies. One hundred percent. I think this is really where technology has been going for the last thirty years that I've been involved. Everything is about making it faster and easier to do. This is the natural latest step of it, and I think it's been really interesting just over the last few years how it started in certain domains like business intelligence ten years ago, and now it's hitting more and more and more domains. When Michael's talking about you know trying to get this more specific to the domains. It's because low code is an umbrella and it covers business intelligence, RPA, application development, platform as a service, integration platforms as a service, and more and more. So this isn't going away. Everything is going this way. As far as the vendors doing anything to, to help us out here when it comes to some of these developments? I, I'm not sure myself. So the question is if the vendors are doing anything to help us out. Don, do you have visibility? Well, uh, Michael is co-founder of a company called Zenity, which does basically static analysis. There's a company called No Code. Um, I'm not going to try and pronounce, pronounce the gentleman's name, but he ran the uh, uh, low code malware talk that was in here yesterday. There's another startup out of Israel that's just getting started. I expect to see more and more of these soon, just like the original OWASP top 10. It took a little while before the tooling caught up to the concepts. I suspect we're at the beginning of an explosion of additional tooling, and, and this top 10, your ability to participate in it can help accelerate that process. So that's why we're asking for you to join us. Sorry, I mean, I guess no. in terms of the people that are providing the platforms, are they assisting like Mendix or Microsoft? Are they saying, hey, we know there's security concerns, here's a couple of things we've done to make it easy, or do we have to rely on third parties? So again, I, I, I don't have a lot of visibility to that. My, my background is not security. My background is helping companies adopt low code, no code, and, and the reason I'm involved in it at this point is trying to help them do it in a safer fashion. That's how I found Michael. That's how I found the low code, no code top 10. And that's why a lot of my passion is how do we make it accessible? Um, what some of the companies are doing, I don't have visibility. Don, do you? Sorry, I'm strictly Microsoft. I want to learn more about the other platforms just vis-a-vis -vis through the top 10. Uh, I've been very immersed in security, been driving security features in the Power Platform. But uh, yeah, they're very aware of it. And we had just another conversation yesterday with SLT on things that we're doing to improve in the future. Uh, I'll let the industry decide how well we're doing at that job. So the, the, the question is, with Power Apps, uh, you, can, you can share the app, you can share ownership of the app, but your question is at the tables, what data source are you using? I'm assuming it's Dataverse? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know how much I can say publicly. 
Yes. Uh, and if you want to talk more about it, let's let's do it offline. Any anyone else? So I'm just going to take the chance for you know a, a, an ask from the audience. Uh, Iana and I have been working on trying to make this available uh, to the non-security people, and the only way we do that is really with a lot of help. We're going to one of the things we're trying to do is break it down by domain because low code is an umbrella, business intelligence, RPA, application development, and whatever else falls under this umbrella. I have background in a few of those areas, but not nearly enough. Uh, we have our first meeting with a broader group who's r trying to take what we've started and break it into all of those categories this Friday. If anybody is willing to help in a small way, again, sending us data, sending us examples, or a big way to take one of those and help lead it to the point where now we can talk specifically how each of these 10 affect each of those areas, w we need help. So anybody who's interested, please let me know. And thank you, everyone. One final comment. I've been working with the Secure Development Lifecycle at Microsoft since the original Trustworthy Computing Memo. I try to talk SDL to citizen developers or even some pro, develop, even pro developers. It's an exercise in confusion because it's too technical. It's written for a different audience. But when I start talking about the low code for top 10, for low code, no code, all of a sudden things click. You can see people are getting it. You can literally see the light bulbs going off over their head. This has been a very useful tool in helping me to drive security at Microsoft. Uh, and it's my belief it can help others as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.